Did you know that South Africa holds the record of the longest aqueduct in the Southern Hemisphere? And in fact, it's actually the fourth longest in the entire world. I certainly didn't until very, very recently. The Orange Fish River Tunnel is an absolutely fascinating feat of engineering. It was opened in 1976 and built to last 300 years and is absolutely critical for millions of people in the Eastern Cape. The tunnel ranges in depth below the surface between 80 meters and 380 meters underground. It's crazy. For most of the year, about 22 cubic meters of water per second from the Kharip Dam thunders through this 82.8 kilometer underwater aqueduct beneath the Seerberg Mountains and it supplies water to the towns of Craddock, Cookhouse, Stainsburg, Somerset East, Bedford, Adelaide, and the cities of Makanda and Klabecha. This water also irrigates crops and dairy farms in the Eastern Cape Karoo Midlands, as well as the Sundays River citrus orchards around Addo and Kirkwood. The tunnels were built to alleviate drought in the Eastern Cape, and the solution comprised of two interdependent engineering schemes. First, a dam had to be built across the Orange River, and then a tunnel had to be driven to take the water across the watershed into a further river system. The Orange Fish River Tunnel, together with its network of canals, weirs, and balancing dams, has enabled these areas to be restored and has made the irrigation of thousands of hectares of additional land possible. The Orange River is the largest river in South Africa by volume, as well as the longest. It starts in the Drakensberg Mountains and around Lesotho as well, and flows westward through increasingly drier country to discharge into the South Atlantic Ocean around Oranjemund, where the volume that discharges is a lot less than where it started, and this is due to evaporation, so a lot of this water is lost along the way. So if there was a way to stop this water and keep it, it would actually be quite smart. This is where the Kharip Dam comes in. The Kharip Dam is actually the largest dam in South Africa. The inlet tower of the Fish River Tunnel takes in water from the Kharib Dam at Overston. That's the, the name of the town that's close to there. The name Overston is an acronym based on Afrikaans Oranya Fis Rafir Tonal. Overston. That's how you get it. I don't know, that's interesting. The tunnel, after going south underneath the Seerberg Mountain, it releases the water into the Tierbus Spreit. And then after that, it goes to the Groot Brak River, and then the water that has come from the tunnel eventually goes onwards along the Great Fish River and the Sundays River. The tunnel is on a self-cleansing gradient of 2%, so it doesn't have any pump, it just flows by itself from north to south. Seen from above, the intake tower is shaped like a four-leaf clover with each leaf containing an inlet gate, all at different levels. This then means that water can be drawn from different levels to help control the quality of the water that's coming into the tunnel. Each of the four inlets can also be sealed off completely to completely dewater the tunnel and this happens for routine maintenance. I really couldn't actually believe that we had an 82 kilometer tunnel, but we do. That's pretty long and we've actually had this tunnel for more than 50 years. So let's quickly dive into the history. The Orange River project was proposed to the government in 1948, but it was dismissed as too expensive. In the end, it was international pressure and the threatened outflow of foreign capital in 1960 that provided the trigger and 490 million was found to fund the Orange River project. That's about 75 billion rand in today's money. The first step, of course, was the building of the Kharip Dam to tame the Orange River. Construction on this dam, which is the largest in the country, began in 1965 and was completed in 1971. The dam was initially called the Reichter Valley Dam, it was then changed to Hendrik Verwood Dam, and then finally renamed the Kharib Dam in 1996, which is the original coin name for the river. Planning for this part of the Orange River project began in 1963 and included aerial photography, geological mapping, and the drilling of nearly 300 exploratory boreholes along the tunnel route. The tunnel is actually so long that the engineers had to take into account the curvature of the earth when designing the tunnel. Pretty cool. Engineers used lasers, which was actually a very new technology at the time, to keep the tunnel in line as the miners dug through the solid rock. 
the calculations were so accurate that when the tunneling teams later broke through and met one another, because it was built in three parts, they were actually less than four millimeters out of alignment across that whole length of the tunnel, which is pretty impressive. The construction of the tunnel was pretty dangerous. There were rockfalls of mudstone and sandstone, explosions and floods of groundwater as they drilled through iron hard dolerite rocks. One methane fueled fire burned for three months and it was so hot that it even melted the rocks. The records show that at least 102 people died in the building of this tunnel, which is a lot of deaths. The construction of the tunnel was split into three parts, namely the inlet section, the plateau section, and the outlet section. Entire towns were built at these three parts to house all the workers. At its peak, the building of the tunnel involved the workforce of 5,000 locals and foreigners from around the world, including junior and senior engineers from places all around the world, such as Britain, France, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and Belgium. Everything in the construction of this tunnel was of the highest standard with no expenses spared. Official tunnel records note the towns that were there that were built were almost entirely self-contained with their own electric lighting, sewerage, roads, medical clinics, primary schools, administrative staff and artisans quarters, all recreational sporting facilities including swimming baths, all weather floodlit tennis courts, football fields, etc. There's even staff housing, slide offices, assembly halls, shopping centers, banks, and all sorts of other amenities. What I find crazy is that after the tunnel was completed, this was all mostly abandoned. Crazy, right? For the construction of the tunnel, a French slash South African consortium called Union Corporation du Mesbori actually built the big dam. Another company called Batinholnoles Kochefa African began on the 78 meter high intake tower. Please don't judge my pronunciation, I have no idea. This intake tower, which is the start of the tunnel, would divert a quarter of the dam's water to the Eastern Cape via the Tiba Spreit, Great Buck River, and the Great Fish River. The town that was created at the beginning of the tunnel is Overston, as I mentioned earlier. A South African company called Orange River Contractors handled the middle plateau section, and the town that they started or formed there was called Midshaft, and an Italian South African enterprise called JCI Depenta took on the outlet section of the tunnel and the town they formed was called Tiabas, named after the nearby hill which is shaped like an old-fashioned tea caddy. I'll put a picture here. During the construction of this tunnel, nearly 2.5 million cubic meters of rock were removed from the tunnel excavation. Every week, 14,000 tons of bulk cement were brought in, first via 40-ton rail tankers to three small railway stations around the tunnel and then trucked by road to the tunnel. By the time it was completed, the 5.33 meter wide tunnel had been smoothly lined with 842,000 cubic meters of concrete with a minimum thickness of 230 millimeters. History records also show that the building of this dam and tunnel opened up a part of South Africa never seen before because they had to build roads and access to build this tunnel, which is pretty cool. Another interesting thing I found was that there was a specially designed vehicle that was built to inspect the tunnel. It had a diesel engine, it was completely sealed electrically, and had a cab on each side so that it could be driven forward or backward along the tunnel. There was even a bicycle attached to this van so that if the vehicle broke down, the driver could drive to whichever side of the tunnel was closest. This vehicle, along with the actual tunneling machine that was used to dig the tunnel, has been lost and nobody knows where it was found. Some people think the tunneling machine is tucked away in a tunnel somewhere close there, but who knows. The town of Overston still lives on as a very quiet town, one or two holiday makers and retirees that have modified the old engineering camp and use it as accommodation. Interestingly enough, me and my family have actually been to the town of Overston when I was quite a lot younger, coming back from Cape Town. And at that time, I didn't know the scale of this whole tunnel project. I didn't even know there was a tunnel there. I saw the inlet tower. I didn't quite know where it was going and the dam, which is really amazing. But I also was fascinated with the town of Overston because it's very like run down um, and 
It was interesting to stay there and we stayed in these prefab buildings which were from the tunnelers and engineers back in the day and we found it a bit eerie but it was, it was interesting nonetheless so that's where I guess this, the, the interest in this project was formed back then when I was a few years younger. Anyway so that's Overston along the Kharib Dam but the engineering villages of Tirbus and Midshaft have long been abandoned and fallen into ruin. At Tirbus where the Italian tunnelers worked and lived. Nature is very much taking over the brick and stone work and there's, you can even see where the swimming pool used to be. There's just grass and bushes and all that, the pine trees, which is uh, crazy. And I also, I always find abandoned places interesting to think about what once was there and what once was thriving. And obviously those people built this project and when they were done, they moved on but it's just fascinating the buildings that were left behind. Um, but they didn't leave behind nothing. They left behind this amazing tunnel that provides water to millions of people across the Eastern Cape. So it's not all in vain. So I guess thanks to these engineers and construction workers years ago, we have this amazing dam and this incredible tunnel. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you thought it was interesting, pop in the comments your thoughts. And if you could give me a subscribe it helps. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!